to Live Your Values series with Lauren Singer and Rob Greenfield today. Round of applause for these two. They are really inspiring. So Lauren is the founder and CEO of Package Free. So this literally came from her brain. And thank you guys for joining us here. Uh, we're a zero waste lifestyle to help you live your life more sustainably. And on that vein, Rob is also leading the way and showing us all how to live more sustainably and more just and just better. So really excited for your conversation. Afterwards, everything's 30% off. Um, and thank you guys so much for being here. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Joy. Um, so we've done a lot of events and talks here. But um, last, the last one that we did, um, I did something different, which first I was wondering if people would respond to it in a way that would make them feel uncomfortable. But I later learned that it was actually quite nice. So you have to bear with me. Um, it was in honor of one of our vendors and one of my best friends who passed about a month ago, Vanessa Blay. Um, her and her two children were tragically killed in a car accident in California. She made the Becky Blue deodorant. Um, there might be a few left actually here, but what I did was take a moment of silence for all of us to just take a second, think about someone that we love. If you guys were with your family for the holidays, maybe you thought things that you don't love about your family, because being your own family sometimes does that to us, but I think it's important, especially during the holidays, during the stress of work, if any of you guys work in retail or e-com or anything, you might be um, really overwhelmed. So I think just to take a moment, think about maybe something beautiful that happened today, and think about someone and send love to someone who maybe you don't get to see all the time, but you care about deeply. So we could just close our eyes and take a quick second. Cheers. 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 So, I'll let you say that. Okay. Mm, yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. 
Um, <laughs> so just a little bit about where, where are you from? Sure. What was your childhood like? Yeah. So I grew up in uh, northern Wisconsin. And uh, I grew up in a small town in Ashland, population 8,620. And uh, my passion as a kid was just catching frogs and turtles and going out fishing. Like all I wanted to do was be outside. And uh, even when I wasn't outside, I was reading National Geographic and basically yearning of seeing the world. I, I read books like Dr. Seuss and I just wanted to go to these far off places like Fiji and, and uh, I just I always had a deep desire to, to learn all the animals. And, and um, so that was kind of my childhood. I also, I, the other central theme of my childhood is that we were very low income. It was my mom and me and three siblings in a two bedroom house that was just, you know, the paint was just chipping off and we had an old rusty car. And basically my whole childhood, I was just embarrassed about, you know, being poor. And I just basically was living my, most of my childhood is kind of like a lie. Just didn't want people to know who I really was. And so I think that's what led me to the next years, which was my goal was to be a millionaire by the time I was 30. And I just really wanted to fit in with, with uh, the American dream, to have nice things and to be able to impress people. And not just impress people, but also just to fit in and also just not be different. And so that's, I'm, I guess, how I would sum up you know, some of the be beginning of my life, and then, and then 2011 is when I woke up and decided that, realized basically that everything that I was doing, the food that I was eating, the car that I was driving, the garbage that I was making, was destroying everything that I loved as a kid. Can you talk about what sparked that? Because your life now is quite the contrast from being a millionaire at 30. So, what was the the moment, or was there a singular moment, or an event, or? anything that, that made you change the trajectory of your life. Yeah, yeah, it changed pretty drastically because my goal is to be a millionaire and now my goal is to never have more than $15,000 of possessions and money total. And right now everything I own is in a backpack right back there. And, uh, and I have about $6,000 to my name. So opposite of being a millionaire, sort of. Actually the opposite would be sort of being extremely in debt. I'm not in debt, so yeah. <laughs> Anyway, um, so what was the question again? So yeah, was there a oh, moment there that moment. sparked? Yeah. What was your light bulb? So basically for me, all I did is I started to watch a lot of documentaries and read a lot of books. Um, Food Inc. was one of the earliest documentaries that I watched. Zeitgeist was another early one. Um, and I read a lot of books. Michael Pollan was a, an early wake up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I just realized that my life was a couple of things. It was a lie that had been sold to me by corporate America that most of the things that I was doing, I was just doing because I had bought, I, I had bought their advertising. You know, like for example, early on, Old Spice deodorant. I realized humans have existed for millions of years without Old Spice. Could I possibly need Old Spice to fit into society? Do I actually need these things? All the chemicals I was putting on my body and my food, all the ways that I was spewing, you know, chemicals and toxins into the world. And, and then also just realizing that my actions weren't in alignment with my beliefs. Because I always considered myself sort of a, you know, environmentally friendly because I recycled. I, you know, I had energy efficient bulbs. I uh, shut off the water when I wasn't using it. Like my mom had taught me the basic things. So I always considered myself environmentally friendly, but then I realized that actually 99% of what I was doing was environmentally destructive, and almost nothing I was doing, or nothing at all, was actually really environmentally friendly because it was all that I had just bought into American consumerism. And so what were the first steps that you started to take when you realized that your, your values weren't in alignment with your day-to-day -day actions? Oh, I just realized that we're talking about exactly what the title of this talk is. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I'm happy we got there. Um, yeah, what were, what were the first things that you did? Because I think for a lot of people, they realize, okay, maybe I'm not living in alignment with my values, but what can I do? I'm just one person. And I think what you really embody is doing something um, and really doing something. So, so what were the first steps that you took to, to start to align with, with what you cared about? Yeah, so... My 
thing was that I wanted to drastically and radically transform my life fairly quickly. Um, but I also knew that I couldn't do it overnight. I'm generally pretty logical and rational, and I was deep in the system. You know, I had seven credit cards, and I had a car, and I had maybe 30 or so different bills, and I had debt, and you know, I had a three-bedroom apartment that I rented. I was, I was in the system, not as much as others. I didn't have a mortgage, for example. So I wanted to radically transform my life, but I, I knew that it would take some time so what I did is I basically made a list of a hundred ways that I wanted it to change. And then my goal was that I was just gonna check off one positive thing per week or better. Um, and as far as the first things, I have a visual, I remember taking everything toxic out of my bathroom and putting it on the curb and then saying, and that was the story of stuff was one of my earliest you know, wake ups. And there's also the story of cosmetics is another video they put out. And I remember just putting all that on the curb and saying, I'm either going to not replace it, because maybe I don't need it at all, or if I'm going to bring something into my house, it's going to be something that, is, that makes sense to put on my body. So that was a, that was a really early one. I was also dating um, someone who was practicing traditional Chinese medicine, acupuncture, and massage therapy, and, and herbalism at the time. So that was another reason that I kind of started there. And then food. Like, at the time, I went to Walmart for all of my food. It all was shipped around the country or around the world, and it was all in plastic, and then in two plastic bags. And I pretty quickly stopped going to Walmart. Then I went to Trader Joe's, and then I realized that's a scam, basically, as far as if thinking it's environmentally friendly, and then transitioning to, you know, eating more at the local farmer's market. Another one was reading, uh, riding my bike a lot more. I had a beach cruiser at the time, so I actually decided I was going to get a bike that I could make it distance on, and uh, and where were you living at? This that time? was San Diego. San Diego. Okay. And so stopped driving my car as much, and and then also just um, slowly but surely got rid of my garbage can. That was a big goal of mine was to not have garbage cans in the house, yes. <laughs> which back then seemed radical, but you know over time it's just normal. So so I want to talk about that a little bit, the the word radical, because I think. Um, there's not many people that would disagree to say that the things that you do are quite radical mm -hmm. and quite extremist, and, and I've gotten that myself about going zero waste. Like, you go all the way. You never mm -hmm. half-ass anything. And, and I guess, do you have a reason for why you tackle these projects or these, uh, these goals in the way that you do? And can you speak to some of the projects that you've done in the sure. past, from, from not showering to you know what you just mm -hmm. embarked on or just completed, I guess? So... Well, I do radical things for a few reasons. One, because I've always been a radical human being. It's just the reality, it's like deep inside my bones. Before I was radically stupid, basically. I just, I like to do stupid things that were, you know, that would get people's attention. Like in college, just like running into a fence as hard as I could and seeing if I could break it. You know, really stupid things when I was drinking. Um, so I've always liked to test the limits and now I choose to, to, to test purposeful limits. Um, and so there's the reality that I just like to do extreme things and test things. Um, now, the other thing is that I realized at that time, not only did I want to change my life, but I wanted to give people an opportunity to change their life. And I was always decent about not wanting to tell anybody what to do, but just give an alternative, you know, when in a half hour news segment, there's 18 short segments and, and 15 of them are negative and only three are positive. And then in between that, it's all commercials telling you that if you wanna be happy or healthy, you need to buy things. I just wanted to put out another narrative and give people another option. So it was, uh, it was that, I wanted to show people another way. And then of course I had to compete with mainstream media and so I had to do things that would actually get my message out there. Because if I just did a little bit, if I did things in a really moderate way, like, you know, I started to shop at the farmer's market and I reduced I shower my once a week. <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't be on, you know, yeah, mainstream, media. mainstream media. So that was the other strategic aspect of it. And then the other thing, the other big part of it is that, you know, you've been called, like you said, extreme. And people generally consider me extreme. 
and I consider myself extreme, but the reality is, is that I'm actually not extreme. The only reason that I'm extreme is because I'm being compared to what is already an extreme society. So, you know, the, the United States has 5% of the world's population, but uses 25% of the world's resources. So that, by definition, is extreme. The whole world, not even close to the whole world, could do that. And so what I am is I'm, I'm sort of uh, the counterbalance to extreme Western consumerism. And so I, I only have to go to these extremes because the extreme is, is already there. So, yeah. Can you speak to some of the headlines that you created from some of the things that you've taken on? So we spoke about the haven't showered in a year, these are the lessons I learned, and actually maybe talk about some of the lessons that you learned mm -hmm. um, from the trash suit and, yeah. and growing all your own food. I'm really curious actually, because we haven't caught up in a while, so this is yeah. kind of more for me than it is for all of you. <laughs> well, uh, my first project was to bike across the United States mm -hmm. and try to have no negative environmental impact. So that's, that meant setting basic ground rules for all of the key aspects of sustainable living, the things that we deal with every single day, which I consider those to be food, water, energy, waste, and transportation. These are things that every single one of us deals with every single day, whether we realize it or not. So for example, for waste, every piece of garbage that I created, I had to carry across the United States with me. So if I had a candy bar in San Francisco, then I had to bike with that plastic all the way to Vermont. And so on that trip, I made just two pounds of trash in 104 days, which is what the average person in the United States makes by about one or two in the afternoon on any given day. Mm -hmm. So on that trip, I was doing sort of extreme things, um, all you know, about food, water, energy, waste, transportation. That was my first project. Um, this, the, the other one was Trash Me, which was right here in New York City. And that was a month of living like the average American, putting all ethics and morals aside for the month, and eating, consuming like the average person, but I had to wear every piece of trash that I created and that. Did everybody see that? Yeah? Yeah. yeah. We had it here for a little yeah. while. It yeah. was awesome. Good. How did you feel after that? What was the lesson uh, that you learned from there? I, it's interesting. I, I felt, in a way I felt better. I, I have to say it was, it, was the, it was the most enjoyable month of my entire life. <laughs> Not because I was consuming, but just because it worked so well. I mean, Basically, everywhere that I went for the whole month in New York City, I was being chased down the streets by people like, it's the trash man! <laughs> you know, people were excited. And I, what makes me, what fulfills me is seeing people's wheels turning inside their head. And people would walk up to me. It's the opposite of all of your trash fitting in your jar. So, you know, I always try to look for visual ways to help people understand important issues. So, the idea was I wanted people to look at me and see themselves without me having to tell them anything, without me having to tell anyone that they were doing anything wrong, because I don't necessarily believe in wrong or right anyway, but having to tell anybody that, well, basically you have to tell them anything. And so what would happen is people would walk up to me in the street and they would say, um, you know, what are you doing? And I would just say, I'm just living like the average American for a month and I'm wearing all my trash. And then they would just look at me, and sometimes they would actually say, oh, that's me. You know, they would, sometimes you would see they realize it, other times they'd actually say it. And so that's, you know, what my, I try to do things in a way that are in people's faces with, without, you know, being in their face. I think it was a really amazing project for me because, like, my whole life is focused around talking about trash and how not to make so much trash, but actually feeling the weight of your completed suit was unbelievable. Like guys, this shit was really heavy. Like we needed, I think it was like three people to carry it up the stairs. Like the day we installed it, I think I fell like four times. It was, it's unbelievable. Like you, you truly don't realize the, the sheer volume of the shit that people create every single day. It was, I think it was a really important project for me and I'm sure it, it, it was for, for so many other people. Um, okay, and then the next project after that was what? Mm, well, um, another project that I just finished was a year of growing and foraging all my food. So for one year, no grocery stores, no restaurants, no 
drink at a bar, nothing packaged, nothing processed, nothing shipped long distances, no, you know, no beer, no even going to the you know, package-free shop to get my food or even the farmer's market. Everything that I ate for the year was either from my gardens uh, or that I went out and foraged, whether it was out in the countryside or right in the cities that I was in. And where was this taking place? So that was in Orlando, Florida. That's where I lived for the last two years. And how was that foraging for food in Orlando, Florida? Because I think of Orlando, Florida, and I think of Disney World. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think of like Universal Studios and maybe like cotton candy. Yeah. But I definitely don't think of sustenance for a year and a half yeah. of life. So, so what were the types of things that you found there? Yeah. Well, the thing is that, you know, that's generally, we, we think of what we know. And if we aren't thinking about where, what might be edible around us, then we'll walk past those things our entire life without ever thinking about it. And the amazing thing is that food is growing everywhere, even in New York City. I was here three years ago and I walked, I was in the park and I saw this guy just picking things out of the tree, eating them. And I, you know, I said, what are you doing? And he said, these are cherries and mulberries. And at the time I didn't know what they were. Are these Suriname cherries? No. So like my favorite things in oh, the world. Oh really? Yeah. These were just little... Cherries. Yeah, little pin cherries or black cherries. And so there's food even growing, you know, all over New York City. It's basically growing everywhere. But what I did in, uh, in Orlando is I turned front yards into gardens. So when I, when I landed in Orlando, I had no land. I didn't have a place to stay yet. And what I did is I found someone and they let me stay in their guest bedroom and I turned their front yard into a garden. And then I turned six yards into gardens while I was there. And that's where I got all my food that I grew and just front yards that you could walk by. And they were all, anybody could pick from them. There was no fence or anything. Who were the types of people that opened up their homes and their property and their possessions to you so you could subsist? Most of the people who watch me on YouTube. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And how did you find them? Did you do a call for them before you started off on this journey? Or, or I guess, like, what did, you know, community is so important, right? And for you, it's a major part of how you live. Mm -hmm. So how are, how are you finding and connecting with these amazing people? Well, so that was partially a joke because a lot of the people that a lot of the people that I end up doing things with have never heard about me, you know, and they just I'm just some crazy guy who wants to build a garden, and they're, they're and sometimes they're like, that sounds good, but you know you're barefoot, you know, and just, I'm not sure about this guy. I'm usually not wearing a shirt and I'm wearing short shorts around. And it's like I'm not sure about this guy, but because some people like it. Some people do, enough people do. There's seven billion people, so you don't need to please everyone to have plenty of people on your side. Um, but so some of it is through, you know, I, these days, I think the word is social capital, I think, you know. Some people base their life around having enough money to get everything they need. And that's what I used to do. I used to design my life around having enough money so that I would be able to buy whatever experience or product or even sometimes friendship that I might have wanted through my material possessions and the experiences that I could give or share with them. So today, instead of it being through money, I look at it through the reality that we live in a time where together we can pretty much meet all of each other's needs outside of the globalized, industrialized systems. Um, we live in a very privileged time where just with this group together, if we just came up with all of our skills, we could pretty much work together to accomplish most of what we need to. And so I just kind of look at that and I try to bring that together. And it's always about what do you want in life that you don't have? What do I want in life that I don't have? And for some people that's a blank lawn with grass and they want food and I don't have a lawn but I know how to grow food. And so we can combine our resources to to create what we both want. That's so beautiful. Um, okay, and then after, so where does your tiny house come in? So that when was I, before yeah. growing your own. So when I lived in San Diego, I lived in a 50 square foot tiny house. That you built yourself. That was one that I bought on Craigslist, bought on Craigslist. for $950. And it was a, I call it a tiny house, but it was basically a glorified, dog house or like a kids playpen on wheels or 
basically a box, but it was designed to look really nice. Not a, not a cardboard box, but like a wood box that had nice lines that made it look like a little cabin. So I bought that for $950 and I lived off the grid in Orlando, or in San Diego. That was 2015 and 2016. And then when I lived in Orlando, I built a tiny house out of 99% secondhand materials for about $1,300. And Where did you find everything for that house? It was mostly leftover materials from construction projects, the two by fours and the plywood and all of that. And how did you know how to build a house? I did it. I met a guy who knows how to build a house. <laughs> how did you meet that guy? He was the uh, husband of someone who had been doing photography for me for the past few years, um, who just liked you know liked my work and and had been following me, and then somehow she wrapped him into building my house for me. That's amazing. We well, it was him. Without him, it wouldn't have worked. He was a carpenter. Um, but it was 40 different people came together and built the house and and so and basically I'm saying house it looks like a shed you know 10 by 10 very simple but so you know I am very much a person who doesn't practice altruism in any way like some people look at what I'm doing and they might think of it as altruistic but I don't actually do it's not that it's again how can we meet each other's needs so these 40 people who came out to volunteer to build my tiny house None of them were there for the most part because they were like, let's help Rob out. They were there because they were interested in tiny houses. So this was an opportunity to learn about tiny houses. They wanted to meet like-minded people. Um, they maybe just did, they they wanted to yeah make some friends um, and a new or just have a new experience. So like. By making building my house a community event, everyone who came out got to benefit from that. And at the same time, of course, I got to benefit because it helped me put together my house. But also just want to say, like, I did a lot of those. It's not like if people just came out and built my house. I, I, you drank your beer and it was I slaved away. <laughs> it took 250 hours or so to build. So it was a lot of work. And you weren't always living there alone. Yeah, so last time you and I met, I was with my partner Cheryl at the time, and we were building that tiny house together, but it took me too long until she left. <laughs> no. It did take me too long, but that's not why she left. Um, and it worked out great, because had we finished the tiny house, we, we basically, we were together for four years, and... We spent a beautiful four years together. It was actually eight because we were involved for four years before, before that four years that we were actually in a partnership. And we, we just, we always had the belief that if a relationship doesn't serve the individual to the best interest and the partnership to the best interest, then there is absolutely nothing wrong with letting those paths go in two different directions. And, we were at a point where there were things that she wanted in life that were different than me and that I wanted in life that were different than her and we decided that we just weren't going to be together anymore as a in a in a partnership but um, but she's still I guess my best friend in the world maybe top 3 best friends um, and uh, and it, timing wise it worked out great though because had we built the house then we would have been in a tricky situation because we would have had that tiny house together. But she basically was left like three weeks before I started building it. Can and we then talk I about it. what it was like being in a relationship and going through all of the different journeys that you went through? Because I know for myself, you know, I've been living a zero waste lifestyle for eight years, and I've been mm. so lucky to have incredible partners that throughout the journey have supported me in very different and important ways from you know, being counterparts to what I was doing, to being uh, people that were absorbing what I was doing and incorporating into their own lives. And, you know, it's a beautiful dance, right, when you're, when you're in a partnership. And I, I think a lot of people have come to me and maybe have come to you saying, you know, I'm in this partnership and I have these values, but my partner doesn't share those values. Do you have instances where you experienced that in your partnership? And I guess, what advice would you give to somebody who, for instance, wants to reduce their waste or wants to grow their own food um, but maybe their partner or their family or their friends don't align with it. Yeah. Well, a couple of things. 
Uh, I would say that one thing that people are very afraid to do is, is leave behind relationships that aren't right. Um, just for example, my dad, unfortunately, was not a good person to have in my life for a while. He was, you know, just extremely negative, paranoid about things. He was as unsupportive as he could get, almost always telling me not to do almost everything that I was trying to do. And so after years of trying, I eventually said to him, you know, I, after many, you know, pleadings of let's make things work, Eventually I said, okay, well then we can't be friends anymore. Like we can't hang out anymore. And so for two years, he wasn't a part of my life. Um, I, you know, I had to, I had to block his number and his, cause it was, it was a toxic relationship. And then, and then after two years, um, I don't remember how it happened, but at least, you know, I started to talk to him again and now it's worked out. Now we have a, a much better relationship. Um, and so, obviously that's kind of a complicated thing, but one of the, the, one of the main things is, if a relationship isn't providing true value for two people, then I think that, that we need to be able to walk away from that, especially if it's a really toxic relationship or an abusive relationship or something like that. Now, in scenarios where it's not that, and it's just a matter of friendship, one of the easiest things is just accepting them for who they are. Ideally, they can accept you for who you are as well, but, but acceptance starts with ourselves. We can't control anyone else. So, like, in the past, I focused on the people around me. Like, Cheryl's mom, I remember, I was, you know, I was I, around Cheryl's family. I remember being uneasy because I'd want them to do zero waste type things. And even around my Aunt Louise, I remember you know, we'd go grocery shopping together and she would double plastic bag. If you're watching Louise, hello, I love you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so, and there was a toxicness in my relationships to, because there was an uneasiness where they might be nervous around me, wondering if I was gonna berate them a little bit or, or I would be uneasy because I wanted to say something but I was holding back. And there was a time maybe three years ago that I just said, Look, there's seven billion people on earth. It doesn't matter to me if my mom or my sister or my friends change because there's literally tens of millions of people right now who want to change. Like this room is an example of that. The fact that Package Free is so successful is an example of that. There's millions of people around the world who want to change. So what I decided to do is put my energy into people who are right there and who want the help, not, not put 10 times more energy into people who don't want your energy and the opposite and the amazing thing that happens is when you put energy into people who don't really want it you you're sapped and you lose energy but when you put energy into people who want it it actually increases your energy so by giving up the desire to affect any one individual person that's what allows me to basically walk around completely carefree it doesn't matter what any individual does as long as overall my actions are helping move to move people into the into the direction. That's so inspiring. One of my favorite quotes ever is, "When you're no longer able to change a situation, you're challenged to, sit, to change yourself." And I think you embody that, right? Like you, instead of trying to change a, a whole system, you've embodied values that you believe in, and, and as such, you've influenced and inspired so many people to to take on the challenge of thinking about other ways that they could live. And I think you've inspired so many people. And and I'm definitely one of them. When we met, I want to talk about what we did when we were together for the first time because it was so amazing for me. Um, so I, I too grew up with a, with a single a single mother, and we definitely, you know, she she was raising me and a child with special needs, and it was a really hard time for her. And we did a lot of things like um, furniture she would find in the trash, and you introduced me to the concept of dumpster diving. Um, and the first time that we ever did it was like, it was electrifying. Yeah. And as someone that for you, like you, you, you love thrills, you love excitement, um, and you love like rebellious things, right? Um, dumpster diving was the coolest shit ever. <laughs> <laughs> we, it, you felt like you were doing something so dangerous and risky and illegal, but actually you're, you're, it's kind of illegal, but you're actually just like picking through trash to find food that's perfectly edible and can you kind of talk about the night that, sure. that we went and, and your experiences because for me that was like 
earth shattering, but for you that was just like a typical yeah. dive. Can you we talk were, about what it's like? We were just walking back to your place and we walked past a bagel shop and uh, Cheryl was there and we said, let's look inside these garbage bags. I bet you there's a bunch of bagels there. And for me, I was like, holy shit, we're breaking I the remember, law. you were pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't sure if you wanted to do it. Because there's also the social stigma, like, and I went through the same thing. It's like, for example, you're, you're running a business do you want to be known as a dumpster diver or the that's, trash girl? Wait. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Even dumpster diving is a cool term. Do you want to be known as someone who eats garbage or eats out of the trash? And that I was feel a, like I'm the wrong person to ask that question. Because you don't mind. No. All right. Good. So, um, yeah, I started dumpster diving in 2013, and I did it because I was biking across the country that first time, and the rule was I could only eat local, organic. Un time that I ever dove into a dumpster, it was me and my friend who was biking across the country. We went around back, we looked in the dumpster, and sure enough, it was full of food. The first thing that I ever ate was a um, half gallon of ice cream that was still frozen. <laughs> Just melted a little bit around the edges. A spoon with me that day, but I had my sunglasses and I used those. <laughs> <laughs> it was half the box, three quarters of the box, right there on the spot. <laughs> and that that was you know for me that was like that was a big moment I saw how much food was going to waste and it's perfectly good food and so since then that was 2013 that has definitely been a central part of my life is eating food that would otherwise go to waste and um, what's the name of the trash art walker <coughs> she has an Instagram account Hi. here I saw her uh, getting tons of fresh sushi from the from the a sushi place that's you know they put it out ten minutes later you go get it it's still perfectly good so I'm definitely gonna get some some sushi while I'm here <laughs> um, but, um, but anyway it's just it's let it's, me know how that goes right, maybe, maybe <laughs> have to come honestly maybe yeah okay, okay. <laughs> yeah so um, I, what are some other like interesting things that you found because I've seen people find like you know there are people that go to like CVS and Rite Aid perfectly good makeup and like thousands of dollars of stuff so like, yeah. what are some other treasures that you found well you just find everything um, I mean for me as biking across the country the best thing you can possibly find is a case of organic uh, peanut butter you know more <laughs> peanut butter than as a cyclist you know that's one of the greatest foods so if you can find organic wheat bread and peanut butter mm -hmm. that's perfect another great thing is I found fresh pressed juice on ice in the dumpster where they threw away ice and then they threw away juice and it just happened to land right on top of the ice so it was still ice cold. Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've dived into about 2,000 dumpsters and there's nothing shocking as far as what individually it is. What's shocking is just that it's consistently. I, I've done it in 30 states and everywhere you go, rural, big cities, we're, we're throwing away insane amounts of perfectly good perfectly good food. Um, and for, for anyone here, does anyone want to go dumpster diving? Yeah, right, okay. Um, do you have any like top tips for what to look for whilst dumpster diving? Um, well, so New York City is a little bit of a different place and you're actually in a great place for dumpster diving because as you said, it's illegal in some places, but in New York City, when they put bags on the street, then it's, it's public domain. Area. So, so dumpster diving isn't, you don't actually dumpster dive here, you just open bags on the curb. And that's completely legal. In other, in cities where you're actually going into the dumpster, that's usually on their property in their parking lot, and then it's technically not legal. But if you are really into dumpster diving, or if you want to go dumpster diving, I have a, a guide with basically everything you could possibly want to know. And that's just at robgreenfield.tv slash dumpster diving. And I think I'll be here for a week. I'll have to do a dumpster diving outing. So um, if I do that, all right, um, I'll post it. Or should we, should, we, should we set a date right now? I know that Thursday, no, not Thursday. Lucy's coming. Wednesday night. Oh, hey, Lucy. I know I could do Wednesday or Friday or Saturday. But I'll post it on my page. That way, uh, we'll, I'll come up with a night. All right. I'll come up the night, and hopefully there's not one in like 30 people. You got like people. 500 people. <laughs> 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 I know, there's a group, Freegan, the Freegans. Yeah. I think their website's freegan.info. And they do 
dumpster diving tours. I'm not sure if they're still active. I went on one with them four years ago. So if you don't end up getting to come out, freakin.info, and I, they don't, I don't know if they do weekly or monthly dumpster diving tours. And they also have tons of information on their website. When we went, we found like 100 bagels that I kept in my freezer for, I don't know, like a good six months. They were good. Yeah, they were and good there, was, there were like really spicy flavors and anytime someone would come over, I'd just like make them a bagel and then they'd eat it and then I'd be like, they got that from the trash. <laughs> So one of the last things that I want to ask you about or talk to you about is one of the reasons why I find you so amazing. I mean, like you do so many incredible things, but you're one of the only active men talking about sustainability, mm. um, which to me is like amazing because you're incredible, but also such a bummer. Mm. Um, why do you think that is? And, and clearly, like you know, this is this is probably like the most men we've ever had at one of our events. So thank mm. you for being you and and kind of expanding the. The demographic of our space, but um, why do you think that is, and how do we get more men to feel comfortable getting involved with sustainability? You're right. It is mostly women tonight, <laughs> eighty or so percent. And yeah, you know, as far as in the zero waste movement and much of the sustainable sustainability movement, it's it's you know two thirds to three quarters women. There are parts of the you know the environmental movement that are far more you know male oriented you know in permaculture for example it's the opposite you know I was just at a regional permaculture gathering in Florida and and I actually had a woman come up to me afterwards and she said you know your resource list is almost all men and I was like ah. Darn it. As soon as she said it, I realized it, so then I had to go and do research, and I found that there were actually a lot of women. I just didn't, I just hadn't put enough energy into finding them, so then I, you know, I added that to my, all, all of them to my resource list, and then I realized there's a lot more. But um, as far as zero waste and this element of sustainability, it is so much more female than male. And I think one reason is, is I mean, I generally feel like women care more than men about these issues. Like, that's just, uh, I mean, I don't know if that's sexist or anything to say, but that's generally what, what I've seen. And you see that like throughout cultures where the women are the nurturers and the protectors. And so that kind of goes into it as well, possibly. Um, and then also, you know, I'm happy to say that I ascended manliness. like. This idea of manliness, like where manliness is sports or old spice, deodorant, or like this certain way, like in American culture, it's even hugging. Like most most of my a lot of my men friends don't hug because they're worried about the feminine aspect of that. And so I think that is another thing is that a lot of this plays more into the feminine than the than the masculine, and a lot of men are it's crazy to say, but a lot of men are so afraid of expressing emotions and such, uh, even crying. It's weird, because for me, crying is just a part I of love life. I when a man cries. Yeah, when you cry, <laughs> great. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, to me, all those things are absurd. It's absurd that our culture has has pigeonholed men into this protective way where they, where they fear expressing their emotions, but it, but it's such a real thing, and I, I think that all plays in. So, as far as getting more men involved, one, it's a, it's a societal structure that creates it in the first place, which is, it's of course hard to change societal structures, but I think that's what both you and I are all about. It's not zero waste. Zero waste is, is you know, what we talk about, but really when we get into the deeper part of the conversation, it's going way back to the foundation of how our entire structure of society is set up. Um, so, did that answer the question? I don't know. That was, yeah. Yeah. Um, I have two more quick questions for you, and then I'm really excited to open it up to all of you guys. I'm sure you have many interesting questions for this incredible human. Um, two things. First is, what or who is inspiring you right now? I always like, you know, mm -hmm. I ask Lucy this question, so I would put you on the spot. But, but I love to point people towards other people that inspire amazing people. Yeah. So, so what's inspiring you or motivating you or exciting you right now? And, um, and how 
can people learn about it? Well, I like this guy. Uh, I just came from his farm this weekend in, in Swope, Virginia. His name's Joel Salatin, Polyface Farm, Regenerative Agriculture. And I, would, I was just spent the weekend with him, and he's one, just one of the most legit human beings on earth. And, you know, I think one of the biggest problems with our environmental movement today is that most issues have been made very black and white. And it's all, so much of it's boiled down into viral Instagram posts. I mean, yesterday I was swiping through Instagram at like however I got into environment section. And honestly, I would say 95% of it was just garbage. I mean, so much inaccurate information and so much polarization that doesn't tell the real story. And this guy, I you know, respect people so much in the environmental movement who actually go far deeper than the headlines and these basic black and white ideas of what is the right or wrong or the only way to do it. And, um, and so he's one person that really inspires, it, it, you know, you know yeah. of him? I, I start, when I was in college studying environmental science, we read all about him. Okay, cool. I was just like, damn, this guy is cool. He was one of the first people yeah. approaching, he was one of the people that showed me that the world that we see isn't the only world we have to live in. Yeah. So um, visit his farm. That would be an amazing thing to do. See where your food's really coming from. Because that's another really big thing is that um, people think when they think of vegan food uh, or their vegetables, they, they just think of these glorious places where everything's fine. But go to, go to any place where almost any of the produce at Whole Foods down the street is coming from and you will not be there and think, oh, this is glorious. No, you'll probably be like, oh, this is a big old industrial factory farm. They just have different chemicals that they spray. But so anyway, regenerative agriculture, and that's actually one of the, that's the reason that I, you know, think you and I connected so well because that first night when we were talking, I quickly got the I quickly saw like okay, you know, she actually really knows like you know the the story starts with your your jar, but you know you understand the intricacies of the the zero waste movement, you know, extremely well, which is what I really respect about you. Thanks, dude. Um, okay, last question, which is kind of a hard question. So if you don't have an answer, that is okay. Um, but I, I like to ask this question because it's interesting for me. Um, if you could play God for a day and make one change that you believe would affect the system in the most impactful way, what would you mm. do? Okay, I'll answer that. Another, I want to mention one other person, that's Winona LaDuke. She's another one of my biggest inspirations right now, and she uh, has Winona's Hemp Farm over in Minnesota, so she's trying to really use hemp as a way to create regeneration. Everything about her, I mean, she's been doing it for like 40 years. Um, and as far as the, the change, I think it would be uh, bringing common sense back, you know? <laughs> like, it's, it's all... It's all about our minds, like uh, the way that we approach the world and the way that we think about things. And if we approach the world with basic common sense, which the reality of common sense is it's no longer common. Like you meet, when, you, when I meet people with common sense, I'm like, yeah, <laughs> awesome. Because our society and our structures are actually designed to, to remove our common sense. Because if they want us to buy everything, you don't need to have common sense to earn some money to buy things. So it actually, you know, I do think that the structures actually benefit from people having less common sense and more just following the, the system. So, yeah, just common sense. If, if, if everybody had common sense, that would change everything. You know, far deeper than any one individual change. Because everybody would then question, you would just then question, question everything. Is it that wrote Common Sense, Thomas Paine? Oh, the, the right? book? Right? T-Paine? <laughs> I need to read that. It's actually really Is good. Is it good? Yeah, it's really good. Yeah. Um, cool. Okay, so now I will stop talking so you can start talking. Um, I'd first like to give you a mini round of applause before the, the big round of applause, so just like a quick thank you. Okay. <laughs> from you guys. We also have questions from the interwebs. Um, so we will be taking both if anyone has a question.
And no question is too crazy. In fact, I encourage the craziest ones. <laughs> the craziest question wins. <laughs> the craziest but... question wins. And I will decide what. <laughs> of course there has to be a crazy question, though. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't, um, I don't know how crazy it is, but um, uh, as far as dumpster diving goes, uh, have there any been, uh, has there ever been any, like, um, I don't know, negative experiences with it, or like, is it ever a crapshoot where you're not sure whether um, the integrity of the food is quite there? But. Yeah, um, and, and I should also say, don't now feel like you can only ask crazy questions. Every question's a good question. Um, so, common sense is actually the number one thing with dumpster diving. Just like you have common sense with anything you buy at the grocery store, you have to apply common sense to your food. Now, unfortunately, we have lost food common sense. Looking at dates and deciding whether food is still good is not, that's not common sense. And that's one of the main reasons that we're wasting, you know, up to half of our food. Because we've removed common sense and put dates on there instead. Um, but so once you get in touch with food, you understand the basic biology of how things work. For example, if you have a bloated package, a bloated package is the gas is being created by bacteria, eating things, breaking it down, and and fermenting and creating gas. Now, when you want that to happen, that's great. That's, that's what creates you know, beer and kombucha and thousands of different fermented foods. But when you don't have the right setup for that, um, like a hot dumpster and milk, that's not the kind of fermentation you want. So if you find bloated, a bloated package in the dumpster, then that's something you generally don't want to eat because that's fermented. So basically the three things are, first you look at it, and if it looks good, then you proceed, then you smell it, and then if it smells good, you proceed, and then if it smells good, then you taste it, and if it tastes good, then you're eating it now, and then you swallow it. Um, now, one of the rules of foraging, one of the, well, the number one rule of foraging, which people call dumpster diving, urban foraging, but the number one rule of foraging for food is you only eat something if you're 100% sure of what it is, and, um, the other thing is you don't eat a bunch of it right away. You taste it. You try out new foods before eating tons of it because you don't know if you could be allergic. So you the start same tripping. You start tripping. I've never tripped off dumpster food. But I do have to say I'm starting to lose my this one beer got I'm a little drunk now. So it's my first time being a little drunk in like three years. I try to keep this up. Next question. Um, next question. Do we have any? There's one over here. Hi, a question's kind of for both of you, but I'm, I'm a zero waste practitioner, but also trying to educate people around it. And I started doing a few workshops in New York City, but I'm curious what kind of advice you give to like a zero waste entrepreneur and how to kind of grow my presence and my business, if you will. You wanna go first? You go first. Okay. Because I actually feel like you've done such an amazing job at creating so many different types of communities online. Okay. Well, I guess the first thing that comes to mind is um, is just be yourself. You know, be the real thing. You know, people today are so attracted to authenticness. Is that a word? Authenticness? Authenticity. Authenticity. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know what I'm <laughs> People are so attracted to authenticity in this world uh, that's so dominated by politicians who are so inauthentic. That's a word, right? <laughs> yes. We're gonna just go in there. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and that's another weird thing about today is that you look at the spectrum of who is who is out there, and you see, a, I would say, a, a smaller percentage of people are actually truly authentic. And so, I mean, that would just be my number one suggestion: be authentic. Another one is. Do what you're really passionate about. Like, do what you wake up and want to do. If you're doing that, it's not work. That's, I'm sure Lauren's working like 15 hours a day a lot of times, and that's because she really loves this and it's what she's passionate about. I don't recommend um, becoming an environmentalist and choosing a topic that you don't really love. Um, and uh, so those would be a couple of thoughts. I mean, I perfectly agree with that. I was thinking about this today, actually, and something I think things that have really helped me because like to your point yeah I work a lot and there's some days where I'm like so tired or don't sleep and the only thing that really keeps me going is my why like why am I doing this 
what's my north star, which my north star is creating large scale positive environmental change. I know it, I can say it in my sleep, um, I dream about it. And if you don't know why you're doing something, um, then you maybe should choose something else or think deeply about it. Um, so, so what is your North Star? What is the mission of what you're trying to do? And, and what are you trying to accomplish? Because I think it's important to, to think about when, when shit hits the fan and business doesn't go so well, which, which it won't some days, um, like why do you stay motivated? Mm -hmm. And, and my, my North Star is what keeps me inspired. How long did it, sorry, to, how long did it take you to like build your, like a, a while, I'm assuming. To build what? Like build your empire. <laughs> <laughs> about this for, I mean, I've been talking about trash for eight, eight years now, um, and to my, to my dad's dismay, he thought it was going to be something very different, um, but I don't know, like, I, I think, like, for me, this feels like the beginning, and I started by saying no to, like, a conventional job that made me cry every day, um, and that, I think, was, like, the start, and I think I'm, like, we're just scratching the surface of what we're doing here, and I think if I keep my eye on, like, my North Star, large-scale positive environmental change, then, like, every decision that I made is, make is centered around that, um, and I think from there, like, who knows what can happen. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And I have no empire, so I can't speak to that. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to say that I'm just, I'm, really, I just, I'm just loving this conversation because you know, like a lot of people would come to something like this and they would think about, we're not talking about the individual ways to go zero waste because you don't need to know the individual ways when you look at the foundation of life. It's all about questioning your values and living in alignment with your values. And once you decide you're gonna live in alignment with your values, everything else is, is kind of, I mean, it's, they're still, it's still challenging. Like we're still all running across the grain of society every day, but. When you're just choosing to live with your values, it makes everything a, a lot, a lot easier. Yeah, I think if you, I, I'm a big believer that if you think about what you want, think about what your values are, you're focused on your North Star, like your body tells you when you're doing something in misalignment with that. I know it sounds really like woo woo and weird, but like that's how I live my life. And when something doesn't feel good, I know that it's not in alignment with my greater goal. I don't mean to sound like so heads in the cloud kind of thing, but but it's worked for me so far. Um, so I think to your point, yeah. like what are your values and are you living them? Ask those two questions. Yeah. How do you travel? How do I travel? Um, sometimes I walk, sometimes I bike, sometimes I get in cars, sometimes I take train or buses, and sometimes I fly. And <laughs> any other ways that I travel? <laughs> Occasionally a boat or a canoe, but so um, generally, if I can, I try to not get into planes. So it's been two years since I've currently flown, but next month I'll be doing a, starting a trip around the world where I will be flying, um, and I'll do that across oceans. But once I get to Europe, for example, I'll be I'm going to be doing a speaking tour. Then I'll be taking trains, buses, and, and um, boats around. Um, to get here from Florida, I caught a ride to Atlanta with someone who was already going that way. Then I took the train to Virginia, then I took a bus to DC, and then a bus here. So we're very glad you did. Yeah, mm -hmm. me too. Any other questions? Um, I volunteer with City Harvest whenever I can, but they're very ninety-five Monday through Friday is when they need volunteers, and then. Are there any other food rescue organizations that you know of that need volunteers? I mean, my, my favorite in the city, because I've been using their service for so long, is Grow NYC. Um, they always need volunteers at the compost pickup right. um, or at the clothing, like the textile pickup. Um, me too, and I, you know, it's actually pretty shitty that I've never volunteered, and I probably should, um, because I've been dropping my compost off for, for so long. Yeah. Um, so they're one, I mean, thank you to Crow and see, but yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of different food rescue programs around. I can't think of any off the top of my head, um, but I know there's other smaller ones. Yeah. Rescuing leftover cooking here. Oh, okay. That's Lucy Biggers. Oh, yeah! <laughs> she helped me spread my message many times. She's at now this, so thank you, Lucy. Thank <laughs> you.
If you don't yeah. follow Lucy, follow Oh my god, literally stop. You won't hurt me. Any other questions? I saw that. So I often find myself like really frustrated, um, like you know, trying to uh, like you know be more uh, like aligned with their wing values and also like be in a society where everyone else is like more or less on the same page. And I understand that we're all like you know progressing in our own ways and our own pace and also like you know, um, I agree, like, we shouldn't waste so much energy on people who, you know, wouldn't really do it, even if, if you're with them 24-7. But for those who are already, like, in a position where other people look up to them, for them to be more environmentally sustainable, but yet there's still some things, like, how would you recommend to, like, approach them about that? Because, like, I don't, like, the most direct way is calling them out, but that may not be effective. How do you how do you approach people who are leaders who are doing things? Yeah, Is that yeah. the question? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, well, I would generally say, well, you're gonna just have to have some guts probably to do that. It's hard <laughs> to call out people who are sort of leaders or are leaders. I would start by saying don't call them out and like don't judge them or like be negative towards them and like be loving. Like if they're already leaders, they've done something that inspires someone. I'd maybe say like approach them like you'd approach someone you love. Um, and say, like, I, I love what you do, and this is something I care about, like, would you like to have a conversation about it? Um, yeah, I would, yeah, approach with passion, you know, <coughs> compassion. In compassion, yeah. I mean, the thing is, like, even if the person is totally off base, if you don't come at them with compassion, then it's unlikely you're gonna get anywhere. So generally, I would say, approach with compassion and a, and a genuine desire, if you strategically actually want to try to get the conversation going because the standard response of someone when they're told that they're doing something wrong whether they're a leader or not is to become defensive so like you know as far as the environmental movement goes i think one of the most important things that we can all do is become psychologists or understand basic psychology because it's all about how people perceive things like, that's, that's the way that I always approach things. For example, wearing my trash around for a month. I had to ask, how will people perceive this? <coughs> if the answer was that everybody would be turned off, then I wouldn't have done it. So you have to, so I try to always design everything that I do around perception. Um, so as far as approaching leaders, you can't put them on the defense because then they're more likely to, to go the opposite direction. So approaching with compassion is a, you know, a really important thing. And um, also approaching with the knowledge, that's the other thing. If you want to be able to explain yourself, it's best to know what you're talking about. So again, this applies to, to any situation, but coming to them with, with information to help. Like um, a lot of times people will, if you don't have sort of solutions or alternatives, then they'll often write you off and just say, um, if, if you can't say, well, what should that person do, then they'll often just write you off. So that's another thing, like sharing the, the alternatives. So I don't know, those are a couple things that come to mind um, for me. And then I guess one other thing to mention is, is, is mo most of our leaders do need to be called out in one form or another. But also remember that everybody is a hypocrite. Every single person in this room is a hypocrite. I'm a hypocrite, Lauren's a hypocrite. We're all hypocrites. It's a matter of reducing our hypocrisy. And the problem is, is that if we want to live in society and we want to see positive change in humanity and our environmental situation, then we all are required to be hypocrites because if you want to be a part of the change, you can't go and live the, the perfect life. So. Um, you know, realizing that, I mean, like, for example, Al Gore flies around the world in private jets. Personally, for me, that's something I think he could do a far better job at and not, and not do that. Um, so, at least so much. But there are things that, like, where leaders really do need to be called out. Um, and so, but the, the one thing that I was going to say is that it is important to remember to also look at their situation because... I mean, just for me personally, I can say, like, I have to always make trade-offs. So, I mean, 
I generally have done a really good job of living out my values, but like for example, next year I'm gonna fly around the world and I'm gonna emit more carbon in that flight, that was the traveling around the world than probably 95% of human beings. Like to call me sustainable would be a complete fallacy in reality. So what I have to do is I have to look at the situation and I have to say, is what I'm doing worth it? Is it going to make the impact that is needed? So some people would call this um, you know, a transitional society. So you can't just look at the current situation to decide what's right if we're trying to shift society. So if I want to shift society, I have to look strategically at everything that I can do and say, okay, there's a negative impact of this, but will it, will it, in a sense, offset itself? So for example, wearing my trash for a month, some people were very mad at me. What are you doing creating garbage for a month? Like, you, sh you should be zero waste. But by creating garbage for that month and creating that visual, thousands and thousands of people stopped creating so much garbage. So it was completely worthwhile. So I don't know, I guess that's the other thing is, you know, I think understanding. Compassion and understanding are two central tenets to my life. So also trying to be understanding. But again, I'm not downplaying at all that people do need to be called out because most of us are ultimately pretty delusional. So we need to be called out to get out of those delusions. So, yeah. One, I'll take, I think, how's it, let's get a temperature check. How many, do people want one question? Clap your hand if you just want one more question. Nobody's gonna be offended. <laughs> I, I wanna be respectful of the room, and I know you all have places to be. Also, it's snowing, so I just wanna give a little bit of gratitude to all of you for being here in the snow. Um, so, two more questions, does that sound, that sounds good? Two more questions? Right. Two more questions. I think we have one from cyberspace. The internet. So the people on Instagram Live, a couple people have asked, do you get overwhelmed by the future and the state of the planet? Do you think we can still create change? How do you deal with that anxiety? That's a great question. You want to go or me? Rob. Okay. So I rarely get anxiety as to the state of the world or our future. And... I think that I'm somewhat of an exception in that way. I think, what's the word they say, like eco-anxiety or something like that? I'm not up with this. I actually don't even really know how to use Instagram, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I'm figuring it out. I um, think you're good, job. You do all right. So I don't really know how to do the stories thing. But uh, <laughs> I think Lucy was trying to help me out with that. Are you story in this right now? right now. <laughs> He's making so a story about my <laughs> inability to story. Um, so, okay, so here's why I don't, you know, suffer from, from anxiety and, you know, depression. And the reason is, is because for me personally, for one, I don't take responsibility for, for the world. I take responsibility for my own actions. I want to make a positive change in the life that I have, but I don't take responsibility for the seven billion. I'm just one person and I can really only take responsibility for myself. So that's, you know, central to my life. The other thing is, it doesn't matter what's going to happen 300 years, 400 years, 500 years from now, if you design your life around having a pot, living in a way that's beneficial to the earth, your community, and yourself now. So what I do is I look at how can I improve, improve quality of life around me now and be living in a way where if we do have a future, I'm positively contributing towards that because basically I just think that life matters like I value my life Lauren's life the life of every person in this room every species the, you know 4 to 20 million species that there are on earth I just value life so if I can improve the quality of life around me and not destroy life around me then that's a life worth lived and that's something that I can generally control and the other thing is that we live in very complicated times. We don't know what the world's going to be like. In and 11 years. In 11 years <laughs> is, is kind of unfathomable. We, we really don't know. So, but, but there are things that we do know. And we do know ways that we can make a positive impact, impact now to improve quality of life now and do it in a way that doesn't strip quality of life elsewhere or the future. I don't know if you guys want to high-five him like every time he speaks, <laughs> but I 
Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, one more question. Does anyone have a question in the room? Okay, last question. Why do you cap your cash? Why do I cap my cash? I never put it down in those exact words, but so why do I, you know, basically I've committed to making less than the federal poverty threshold for, for life, as long as I'm alive. And I, in no way am I trying to simulate poverty. In fact, a, a little bit of a segue, I always like to just acknowledge my privilege because a lot of what I'm doing I can do because of the privilege that I have. Dumpster diving, you know, because, I, because I'm white and because I'm pretty eloquent, if the police show up, they're not really gonna do something, but homeless people are much more likely to get arrested. Traveling the world with no money, Western passport, white, not being, you know, running from a dangerous situation, that's why I can easily do that. Biking across the country, you know, so many of the things that I do, I can do out of a, a place of privilege, which kind of ties into that question. I can choose to live with very little money because it's a choice, but if you are just trying to get by day to day, then to try to earn as little as possible is not really something that's gonna work. So some people would call this voluntary simplicity. Um, so the reason that I choose to live with, with a minimal amount of money is because I'm trying as much as possible to live in a more just and sustainable way. So in a world where you know 1% of the population has what, like 50% of the, the finances, I want to stand out you know, as the opposite of that. I want to live in a way that is more equal with the general population. And so it's a way of, it's, a, it's honestly, it's a way of restricting myself from getting too much. Like I could be making a lot of money off of, of what I'm doing, the problem is, is that often when you have the up, when you're making a lot of money, it can get in the way. Like there's some people who do a great job at making money and plugging it into the places that matter. But the reality is, is that most people, when they get a lot of money, then they rationalize that flight to Polynesia for vacation or, or, or things like that. So it's a way to just force me to live my values. If I don't have money, I got to connect with my community. That's another thing. I am, I am dependent upon humanity because I can't, I can't meet my own needs. I need other people to meet my needs. And that, another thing about that is that's a way to encourage other people to, pe to depend on each other. Because the only societies that I've seen that are somewhat sustainable or are sustainable are societies where people are actually dependent upon their neighbors. So. Currently today, in a monetized society where I can just pay for everything I, I want, you don't have to understand your actions and how they affect the world around you. But when you don't have money, you actually have to understand your relationships and how things you know, get to you. So you know, that's just a, a few. It's, uh, there's obviously a lot to it, but that's uh, you know, a bit of an idea of why I minimize the amount of money. It's that documentary, yeah. Dollar a Day. Oh yeah, living on one. one. Have you guys seen that? Yes. Oh my god. Yes. That's a, such an incredible yeah. film. Chris Temple and yeah, Zach Chris and Temple. Grassley. They're the guys who filmed Trash Me, actually. Yep. And they've got a new, new, new documentary coming out in March. Did, did the they, they do it. Solemn Neighbor yeah. with Angelina Jolie? Oh, I didn't know she was in it. I think she was, or she was associated oh, with really? it in some way. Oh. I might be oh. lying. I'm sorry, Chris Temple. <laughs> um, but that's a really interesting documentary on like the value of a dollar in different yeah. places in the world. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for being here. Um, I think like the radiance that you create and, and how inspiring you are and how you decided to challenge what the world looks like, I know has motivated me and so many people in our community so many times. So I'm grateful that you decided to come here and um, share your life with us. So on behalf of me, my team, um, and everyone here, thank you guys for being here and, and thank you for, for I'm so happy.
I'd be nothing without all of you because that's <laughs> my goal is to inspire. So. And last thing, we're trying to do more talks with more incredibly inspiring people. So if any of you know of anyone who you would like to introduce to the zero waste package free community, um, this woman who's hiding behind here, <laughs> this is Joy. <laughs> Joy's at the Red Sea campus there. Um, please share their name with Joy. We, we would love to invite them to have a conversation. Nice. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you for coming out.